All right. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm looking at the list of participants and I see uh, a lot of people that probably already have used Graph in the past. Um, and so we have some really exciting news, as you read in the announcement, is that Graph was uh, entirely ported to HTML5 and now uh, can be run, it's become a part of Lego Graph and can be run in the browser. And so I'm, what I'm going to do today is um, I'm going to show you how it's integrated in the browser, but more importantly, I'm going to give you a tutorial in how to use Graph in 10 lessons, maybe 11. Um, and <clears throat> um, so right now you'll just be looking at your screen, but in the future, I suggest that you really treat this as a tutorial where you take the PowerPoint on one screen and uh, me going through the tutorial on, on another screen and that should get most people that are not familiar with the Lego Graph through the whole process. So let's begin. So here's the things I'm going to talk about. Yeah, I'm going to teach you how you can connect to a Lego Graph and load some data and then check if the data was actually loaded. Then manage your triple store with AG WebView. This is very short. I mean, this is about Graph, but there are certain things. Graph is made for visualizing uh, semantic graph databases, uh, writing queries. Uh, we have a visual query editor, the discovery, graph analytics. But Graph is not really meant to do uh, management of a Lego graph. So we'll go a few seconds through AG WebView. And then we go <coughs> through the real things in Graph. We'll go through the graph view, where you see a graph representation of whatever you want to see. Uh, the G in front means that this, this is the keystroke to get to the graph view. Or we get, we, I'll show you what, how you can look in a more conventional way at your graphs by going to the table view, the B is for table here. Uh, if you have deep taxonomies or ontologies, then sometimes the outline view is more like a tree view on your data that some people really like. Then I'll show you how you can write queries by hand, or if you're lazy like me, write queries by just drawing queries. And to make it even easier, how you can look at an existing graph on the, in the graph view, find a pattern in the graph that you like, that you want to know how often it happens, and then automatically transport it to the graphical query view editor. Then for those, um, uh, that have temporal data will show you how to use the time machine. I actually see that in the audience you have the, uh, Marcel who, who kind of wrote the whole uh, um, spec for how we should do this. And I'll talk a little bit about how you can use pictures for notes instead of just having text notes. And if we have time enough, I'll show you that even if you have graph in the browser connected to a Lego graph, you still can use that to go to every other triple store on the planet or, and, and I'll do a little demo on the DBpedia. All right, so to begin with, um, before we start the lessons is, but what version of Graph should you download if you wanna play with this? Uh, right now we have version Graph 8.0, the first Graph in the browser uh, for AG7. Um, as I said before, it's now included in Lego Graph. You can install it on anything, I mean, any Linux. So um, today I'm gonna to do my test or my, my demos on the Windows subsystem for Linux, so on a Windows machine where they have integrated Linux, but we run Docker in the VMs, uh, we have AMRs that you can download, and we're even now on the AWS Marketplace. So here's the link, if you wanna go here, you can yeah, start your own uh, free or, or enterprise version of Allego Graph with the graph included. Um, and within a few weeks, we also have the same thing for Microsoft Azure or for the Google Cloud. Yeah. Um, so we have graph in the browser, but the standalone version of graph is still here. Yeah, so if you just go to this link here, you can download it from there. Um, so on, we, we, what we did is we tried to so uh, the layout for um, Linux and Macintosh was always kind of suboptimal. So we even recommend for people that work on Linux boxes or Macintoshes 
to use the standalone Graph because you can even then start the browser on your browser, uh, a version of Graph on your own machine. Um, and <coughs> if you want to play, just remind yourself, Allegro Graph 7 or any Allegro Graph is free up to 5 million triples. And if you need more, then call Craig. Yeah. So, and then we're going to do um, the demo <coughs> and the tutorial today using various uh, data sets. All the data sets can be downloaded from this web page here. We have a little extraction from movie data and actors from the DBpedia in a file called actors.entriples. Uh, we have crunch based data from 2005 to 2014 uh, with uh, about acquisitions and investments of well, uh, big companies into smaller companies. I'm going to use that for my time demo because it's got some really nice features. Um, and we have a slightly bigger data set, uh, about 13 million triples, where we have 100,000 clinical trials, FDA uh, trials, we have 4,000 diseases, 4,000 side effects, uh, 10,000 brand names for drugs, then some drugs information, we have the MESH taxonomy that we use for the indexing of the text in the clinical trials. And we have several thousand anonymous people with medical notes. Yeah, so three interesting uh, 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 tutorials that you can download for free. By the way, they're all built up from open source data anyway and from linked open data. Okay, so now let's begin with the tutorial. So the first thing is going to connect to the server and load your first data. Now we assume for this, that you have installed a Lego graph somewhere and you have access to one. At the end of this entire tutorial, I'll tell you a, uh, <clears throat> that we have a demo server somewhere. Okay, but let's begin. So um, we're going to download the Actus file from the graph. Then I'm going to go to my local installation on my laptop of a Lego graph and I'm going to load the data. Sorry, I create a new repository called Actus, then I load the Actus data into that uploaded file. And I go to the database and then I start graph, and then I check if everything loaded well. So let's begin. So here is my browser, and let's do this. So I can get there by just doing localhost. Yeah. And now I've connected uh, to my local uh, Allegro graph, and here's some things that I preloaded. I already had Actors loaded, so let me delete it. Really delete the repository Actors. Yes, maybe I should make the letters a little bit bigger. All right, okay, so let's make a new repository. Let's call it Actors. So it's throwing away the old one, it's creating a new one, and it has zero statements. And I'm gonna load some triples from an uploaded file. And so here is the file loading uh, uh, dialog in AG WebView. So I can choose a file locally and I have uh, yesterday downloaded the Actors database from my website. So let me take this. By the way, this is a gzipped file, but the Lego graph will just look into the gzip name and figure out what the type of triples are. And then we you download, so now we have Actors selected. If you do big downloads, yeah, then please use this button here because that will use multiple threads to load. In this case, it's so small, it doesn't really matter. And for big data sets, use the bulk load. Once you've done that, you click on OK. And it's updated, it imported the, uploaded the triples. It's now importing them, so it's kind of starting the database. And so now we have a very, very tiny database yeah, that we can play with. And what you see here is uh, that when you open the database, you have this, the graph button here, so I can actually click on it. And so now we have graph in the browser and we wanna know um, if actually everything worked out fine. So one way to test that is to go to display and then say display some sample triples. And in this case, it will display about 60 triples. And here is some data yeah, from our Actus database. And just for fun, you can look at this. Yeah. 
But anyway, we know that everything is fine. The triples are in the database. So that is the tutorial part number one. So let's now go to this next part. Let me go back to my PowerPoint. Um, so the next part is managing your triple store with AG Web View. So again, this is a graph tutorial, so I don't want to go too deep. But again, graph is not meant to really manage your database like you would with any uh, uh, database management tool. But AG Web View is specifically built to manage your triple store. Yeah? So if you want to load bigger data sets, then you use AG Web View. Although if the data sets are really big, then use the command line and use a, a tool we call AG Tool. If you need to optimize your indices, then um, you can use this because you're, uh, just like in a regular database, sometimes if you load a lot of data all the time, indexing process uh, might need a little bit of, of, of a kick and you can optimize the indices in AG Web View. You can look at query plans, query plan execution. If you want to monitor the data, or monitor the server load, you can use it. If you want to do a simple backup restore, you can do it straight from the tool, et cetera, et cetera. Just let me show you where that is in our tool. Um, so we were here. Yeah, let me get out of this particular, oh, my Zoom window is in front of it here. I can always go back to this little arrow here and see all my databases. So say I go to the healthcare database. Yeah. Then here are all the things like I just talked about, export triples, warm up the store, backup, uh, things like delete duplicate statements, optimize the repository. We have a whole bunch of uh, reports that you can look at. Yeah, so if you want to know how much disk space you use, you see uh, the main indices that we have for Allegro Graph, how much disk space they use, and how optimized they are. You see here the color green, meaning uh, that the indices are very healthy. Um, sometimes you might get yellow or red. In that case, you click on Manage Triple Indices. You can select the indices that you want to optimize. You click on Optimize, and well, it would go from red or yellow to green again. Anyway, that is just in general about how we use this tool. Yeah, and there's not much else to say. I mean, if you want to make new users, then uh, oh, we have a whole thing to actually make users and uh, do all the user control. But that's all I want to say about Allegro Graph Web View for today. Let's go back to Graph and to the, and to the tutorial. Um, so we've done this one. And then let's talk about the screen that you will be in most of your time. If we call it the graph view, well, maybe you won't, but I, I'm definitely spending 70% of my time when I'm in graph in this particular place. And I always give demos with uh, graph and people like it when they see me do it. And then later they try it out for themselves and they're staring at this big blue screen and they think, oh God, how do I get something on this screen? So I'm going to give you three ways a four ways to get something on the screen, yeah? And um, that is kind of sufficient to get you going and get something on the screen. So let's go back to my graph here. So let's say I'm taking uh, the healthcare database, the open, and I'm opening graph. And as I said, let me, and uh, I hate when I see the whole, uh, uh, top of the browser. So usually I hit F11 and I get the full browser view. Yeah, so now it almost looks like graph in, in Windows. And the first way to get data is to click on display and display some sample triples. Yeah, you click on this um, and then what you see is you get your triples, well, you get 60 triples of the screen that form a graph. Yeah, here you see um, the, the names of the predicates, and here you see the name of the classes. Yeah, here's the diseases. If you want to see the predicates on the screen itself, you can always push the button N, and you see the names of the predicates next to it, and, but I don't like that, so I usually have that turned off. Yeah, so this is the first way to get something on the screen. Uh, on the screen. The second way to get something on the screen is to use the text index. So I'm going to remove all my um, 
all the things on the screen. I click on remove and it says remove all unhighlighted notes. Now I always use the, everything in Ruff has a key stroke, um, but for now let me use this here. Yeah, so now I have an empty screen and I can use free text indexing. I hit letter H, actually text search, yeah, find and display notes H and say, let me get something with aspirin and cancer. And it finds a number of clinical trials that have the word aspirin and cancer somewhere in there. Yeah. So, so now I again have something in the screen. And if I want to show more information, I can just, and I'm going to talk about that much later, a lot more. I can show you some data that we have there. Yeah. So using text indexing, but how do you get a text index? So I'm also going to talk about in uh, right now. So, because when you build or load data in your um, uh, database, you don't automatically get a free text index because users have to choose what they want to index on. So let me delete all the triples again. Let me show you how you build a text index. You click on text search, then you say select or create a text index, make a new index, and uh, we'll make it something like a Craig or whatever you want to do it, or labels. Yeah, make a new text index. And then what happens is it will go through the database, find all the predicates in the system. And then here you can choose for what you want to create a text index. So for example, uh, I said label, is there a label in here? Yeah, there's a label in there. And then I can choose whether or not I want to index literals. And that if I index resources, maybe only do it after the namespaces. So don't index all the, uh, the, your, the, the, the namespaces. You can choose what fields to index, what the minimum word is. And once I click on OK, it will build a text index. Yeah? So it's as simple as that. I'm not going to do that now. OK. So I have now discussed two ways to create something on the screen. The first one is display all the sum triples. Then the second one was use the text indexing. The third way would be um, to, let me see here, my cheat sheet here. Um, oh yeah, do a simple Sparkle query. So I'm hitting the letter, well, no, I'm not hitting nothing. I'm going to the query view. If you can get to with the W here. And here it says select SPO where SPO limit 100. Yeah, let's do this. Limit 50, 59, okay, also good. Yeah, here what you get is results. And um, it's probably nothing fun to watch, but we can find um the graph version of the results of the sparkle query so again another way to get something on the screen again let me show you i went to the query view i did run query i got some results and then i say create visual graph and i get my results yeah and it's very weird results but i just show some random triples okay so this was the third way to get something on the screen let me delete everything again with Control alt z And then the fourth way is um, <clears throat> we have a command called Control j Let me see what it is here. Uh, where's Control j Oh, yeah, here. Display a simple instance node by type. And so if I just do Control j it will find all the classes in my one healthcare database. And then it, um, so I can say I want drugs. There's multiple drugs in this database actually. And so what it then does it, is it will find like 20 or 30 random drugs in the system with, that you can start to play with, yeah? So again, you have this big database, you have, you have lots of classes in there and you just want to see an example of one of the instances of a particular class, use Control J, choose your class, you'll get a selection of things to look at, and you click on it, and now you have the thing that you wanted to see on the screen, and then you can take that to go further. Um, 
Okay, so that was the fourth way. So now let's go do something else. And that is sometimes I want to, um, what we call explode a, a node by instantly showing all the properties that you're interested in for a particular node. So let me delete this. Let's get a clinical trial going. So let me do this again, aspirin and cancer, and I get a clinical trial. Yeah. And now I want to see, and I click to the right here, you see that there's a lot of properties for this one clinical trial, but I don't want to see everything. I just want to only see some things. Say, I only want to see the diseases, drugs, side effects for this particular uh, uh, clinical trial. So how do I do that? Well, I can hit the letter P and this will give me all the predicates in the system again. So lots of predicates. And I select a few of them here. I click OK. And now I have a selection of predicates. And now I could right click and display link notes for the current predicates or the letter F. I do this. Yeah. And I automatically get all the data. Uh, associated, well, associated with the node yeah, based on the set of predicates that I chose. Now, <clears throat> the good thing is you don't always have to make that selection. Once you've made a selection, you can actually just do shift P and it will show you a previous selection that you made. Yeah. So once you've made a selection, Graph will remember it the next time. Instead of hitting P, you hit shift P and you get to one of your previous selections of uh, predicates. <clears throat> then very important for you to realize is that uh, we make it very, very easy to go back to previous states. Yeah, so you kind of never can uh, really make a mistake when you're playing with the graph, because we literally trace the entire history of what you had on the screen. For that, we have the letter Z. So if I do this, you'll find that I find all the previous screens that I had so far. Yeah, and I can go back and go back and go back. Or I can go forward when I hit the letter Y. Yeah. So we keep, so never worry about playing with the graph and, try and, 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 and worry about that things got out of whack because you can always get back with Z or forward again with Y. Um, <clears throat> then the other thing is you don't always like what you see on the screen. So one thing you can do is hit the letter R, yeah, and it will reformat the screen. Um, so R stands for reorder, yeah, so it's in the layout part, layout, redo from scratch. Um, sometimes the data on your screen is way too wild. Uh, sorry, it's too stretched out. Then one way you, what you can do is... Um, hit the letter six, and it will try to compress the graph a little bit more on the screen, yeah? And sometimes the graph is um, in a different place, then you can hit the letter C to get the graph back in the middle again, yeah? So there's lots of little thingies that you can play with. Um, now, on the standalone version, you can use the uh, your mouse wheel to make things bigger and smaller, uh, but the, the, one of the few exceptions where the graph in the browser doesn't work like the, um, the standalone version is that you have to use uh, bigger, smaller, and bigger than to blow up the graph. Okay. So here. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> then, and by the way, don't worry, everything that I'm showing you here is also described in the PowerPoint. So if you want to do this again, step by step, then there's no problem. All right, so we're here and what you might have seen already is that the corners of my, let me go back using the Z button. The, the border of these things are sensitive. They have gestures, yeah? And so I would recommend that you just play with it once you get into using Gruff, but um, this one is an important one. Display link nodes from an outline. You can click on that and then you can say, well, let's click on colon, colon cancer and this one and polyopsis. And I definitely want uh, only this and this side effect. 
and maybe I want um, a label. Yeah. So that is one that that's probably the thing that most people use the most is this little figure gesture here. Yeah, where you can go straight into the tree. The other one that I use a lot is um, let's make, make the graph a little bit more interesting. And I'm going to explain to you later how to do that. But I select this guy, this guy, and this guy. Let me do this one here. And I'm going to find the shortest path. Okay, so I have a fairly complex graph on the screen now. Well, <coughs> actually, it's not that complex at all. But <coughs> so this is one way to look at the graph. And I can make it a little bit smaller and more compact. But in many cases, this is actually much more helpful. Do tree layout from selected nodes. Yeah. So in this case, it doesn't look really that good. But do you see this? So in many, many cases, and I'll give you more examples, it's really helpful um, to use the tree rendering. And by the way, how did I select the nodes? You just do control left click. Yeah. So if you want to know how to do this, control left click will select nodes. And if you want to unselect, just go on the background and do control click, and then things get unselected again. Again, something that you need to know about. Um, then, I already am looking at my cheat sheets with many more things that you can do. Um, let's go to shortest path, yeah? And so I have, uh, let me go back here. Let me go back to my three clinical trials. Okay, so I have this here. So there's two ways to do shortest path. One way is to do click one time. So now it gets red, it means it has focus. You hit the letter Shift F. You drag the mouse to another clinical trial and you find the shortest path based on the selection of predicates that you made before. Yeah, and I can do this, Shift F. And I think I already did that before. Yeah, so this is one way to do it. Let me go back with C. Another way to do it is just select all the nodes. And again, this is a useful thing to know, but you can drag a box around the nodes that you want to select. And then you hit Shift F without drawing a line between them, but just select the node you want. You hit Select F and it automatically will find the shortest path between each of the nodes that you saw on the screen. Yeah. And then I can take anything in my database. So romantic kissing. There's a clinical trial that says that your immune system is a lot better if you are more intimate. Yeah, so we have a clinical trial about aspirin and cancer. Yeah, I want to link it up to this. Yeah, and I can, oh, the reason I did this is because sometimes when you do a shortest path, yeah, there might be literally thousands to hundreds of thousands of links. So we limit this artificially to 200. 200 paths, you can set it in the global options, the how many paths should be in here. And then you can show, uh, choose to show the first 50, or you can select the subset. And here you see uh, ways to go from these two, between these two clinical trials. So one of them is about anxiety. And so from this trial to anxiety, to this trial to deliver the disease, one is with kidney, kidney carcinoma, breast cancer, and um, peptic ulcer, yeah. And then you see how you connect. All right, so I hope that was helpful. Let me continue with this. Um, then if you want to store, so sometimes you have a nice thing on the screen and you want to share it with other people. And I've never tested it in Graph in the browser, so uh, let's see here. Uh, but you can say file, save layout state. Yeah. And this would be uh, my first. And now I have saved the layout state to a file. Yeah. So now if I hit, if I do file load layout state, yeah, then there's my first. And I can, okay, let me get everything out here. Now I can do Control L. It will show you all my layouts that I have. I click on that, and I get my layout state back. Yeah, very useful because these things 
are text files that you actually can send to other people. So you say you find an interesting pattern, then you can save it and then give it to someone else. Um, okay, so that is that. All right, so I talked enough about the graph view. Uh, oh, and, and one more thing. Sometimes, yeah, so you're looking at this. This is an important one. Yeah, say we have a brief title. One of the things that some people really appreciate yeah, is that they can give uh, notes their own name. So here we have this trial, effects of romantic affection of blood chemistry and immune parameters. Yeah, so this is the IDFS label, the brief title. If I wanted to see these clinical trials, not by their trial number, but by their brief title, then I can actually do this. I can copy, uh, say, um, copy predicate URI to clipboard. So now it's there. And then you go to global options and I go to node label predicates. And then we say custom predicates for node labels. And then, uh, and, and here's something uh, that is gonna be a little bit confusing. We can't use control V, you have to use control shift V because we have a little trouble with the, the um, the security model of JavaScript and doing and having access to clipboards, but in the next version, we'll have figured it out. But anyway, you can copy this thing here. So now we have the label predicate in this widget. I click on OK. Yeah, so now, um, say I do aspirin. And now you see everywhere that the clinical trial names are, are removed. This is very handy because sometimes you get data sets where people don't define a pref label, a SCOS pref label or an RDFS label, and then you can choose your own way to put labels on notes. Yeah, so that's it. So let's go to now to the table view. Uh, let me get rid of this global options. Get rid of it again. Uh, custom predicates and put this in front, I believe. So now it's gone. There it is, yeah. Um, so say I want a more traditional view. Let's go to the table view now. So I double click on it. And now I'm in the table view. So it's the same information, but now here is the subject of your triple. Uh, it's a clinical trial. And then here you see brief title, effects of romantic affection of blood chemistry and immune parameters, the collaborator agency, uh, well, all the things that you normally would expect yeah, for this. Um, I could say I click on the disease, this one here. So now I'm in the disease uh, database kind of. Here are associated genes with this disease, uh, what kind of class it is, uh, the label, potential drugs. And we also see an important thing here, and that is notice this thick kind of bluish line. Yeah, above the bluish line are all the triples that start with hypercholesterolemia. Why did I choose this title here? Um, whereas below are all the triples that actually point to this disease. Yeah. So this is all above here is all the outgoing links. Here are all the incoming links, if that makes sense. And then one more thing that's really important for you to understand is that uh, this looks all very, very readable, but what Graph actually does is when it has to replace, uh, sorry, if it has to uh, display something, is it first looks to see if there's an RDF label for it and uses that to display the node. If that's not the case, it tries to find the last part of the URI. Yeah? So, but I can pu always push the letter eight, yeah? And now we can, see all the underlying RDF. Yeah, so here you see the disease sum predicate. Um, can you see what it is? And here the, um, the genes. Uh, here you see the drugs. Yeah, let me, let me hit the letter eight again. And now you see, yeah, so yeah, so with eight, you only see the URLs. And now you see everything by label, if that makes sense. All right, I think that's about all I want to say about the table view. Um, then we also have an outline view. Yeah, so um, if I go back to the 
to here, then uh, I could, instead of hitting the letter B on this, I can also hit the letter O. Yeah, so meaning go to the outline, to the outline view. Yeah. So if I hit, the, I select this guy and I click O, there I, then I'm in the table view. This is better for ontologies, but for now it should be good. Yeah. Oh, that's way too many. So let's take here is a clinical trial. And here you see, oh, an important thing I forgot to say is this again only shows the predicates that you selected with the letter P. Yeah, so here, so if you want all, you get all of it. So if you say select all, probably not a very good idea right now, but I can click on this. And then here we see, and then I can go through it. Um, yeah. And then the color blue means going deeper into the tree and the color black means going back up in the tree. Yeah? And I just want to mention this view because for people that build ontologies and taxonomies, this is a wonderful compressed tree view of your data. Um, and for some people, they really like it. Other people use more the graph view and the table view. Yeah. All right. So then writing queries. Yeah, so let's go there. Um, <clears throat> so in a Lego graph, you can write Sparkle and um, uh, 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 Prolog queries. And again, how do you go there? You type the little W or you go to the query view. And here you see, um, well, where you type your queries. Yeah, so SPO, where O uh, has a P2, uh, uh, well, a P2. Jesus, I can't type. Okay, well, uh, Z, um, P, two, O, two. Yeah. And then I can run the query and I get my results. Yeah, so uh, one important thing to remember is global options. So um, for namespaces, yes. So we have a bunch of namespaces defined in the system. They're, they're here. Uh, but if I want to make my own namespace, I can just say fr is HTTP, HTTP france.com. Yeah. Okay, and I added my own namespace to the whole thing. Uh, what more can I say about it? If you have a particular query that you really like, then you say, Safe query, query text, and then you, um, my first query. Yeah, and then later, if I want to do it again, say, load query text, and I get my first query. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, and you can load this in OK, and then you get your query, and you can run it again. So anything else? Uh, oh yeah, query options. So you can, there's, there's many, many, many ways you can control timeouts, et cetera, et cetera, and how many results you get back. And so you just have to explore for yourself the global options and the query options yeah, and see what timeouts you want. Um, so now the timeout is 30 seconds. Uh, Always when you do a very long running query, you also see that the button run query changes into a button that says cancel query. So you always can also cancel a query while you're at it. All right, I think that's all I wanted to say about the query view. Um, then, so now I just wrote that query by hand. Where am I here? Oh, here. But, um, Writing queries by hand is, is, a, is not always easy, yeah? So we have another mechanism for you to write queries and that is the visual query editor. Um, so just for fun, let's do this. Yes, here we have a clinical trial that has this and there's another trial that links to this, yeah? And then we had this trial that's say linked to, I don't know, Cholesterol. Yeah. Let me select this one too. So 
So now we have selected a subgraph and I can go to select and I say um, copy highlights to graphical query view, put it in the middle. Yeah. And this is the subgraph that I looked at, but I can actually turn this into a query. And for now, I'll just keep it very short. I will do this. And I say, um, convert highlighted to variable notes. And what you see now is that I can turn this into a Sparkle or Prolog query. I can do multiple things. I can say, well, I only want to see 10 results. And the results need to be maybe distinct, um, but it doesn't matter really. Yeah, what you see is that automatically a Sparkle query gets created and executed. Yeah, so let me repeat what happened. I was in the query view, I changed certain things uh, into variables, I do run query. I get this query here and the results and I could click on create visual graph. Now the query view is pretty powerful because I can do other things. I can say, well, add a variable note, new note variable is Jans, and say, add a predicate link, yeah, here, and say recently selected predicates. Oh, maybe uh, this is, this was a disease, so that's wrong. This is a disease, so we want to say get the type, add predicate link, yeah, sorry, add predicate link, go to this thing here, uh, and then say uh, common predicates, say the type, yeah. So now we have type, and this looks ugly, Jan, so let's do this, um, rename node variable to type, yeah. And now I can run the query again. Yeah, and now I get an extra column for type. So I just can keep adding elements to my query and build them up completely visually. So this is kind of what I wanted to say about the query editor. And um, I also said I would talk about discovery, but what I want to stress again is I was in the graph view. I see an interesting pattern. So, um, I select the elements of the graph I then th that I'm interested in. I go to select and copy highlighted to graphical query view. And then from there, and you kind of remember what we did. Yeah, so you see interesting patterns on your screen, just select them, change some of the constants into variables and you have a beautiful query. All right, so that is eight. Then um, using the time machine for temporal data. Yeah, so there's always temporal data in our database. Sorry, in, in many of the databases that we build repositories, there's an element of time. Yeah, so let's just um, go here, or just for fun, let's go. Let's go here. Let's also do a little bit of playing with the um, standalone database. So this is the standalone database. By the way, this also the time machine also works in the graph view. Don't worry about that. Yeah. So I open a triple store and the triple store is called Crunchbase. So it's uh, data from 2005 to 2013. I do this. And so now I have um, Crunchbase open, less than 2 million triples, very interesting data and say, let's find MongoDB in the database. Yeah, here we have MongoDB. And who invested over time in MongoDB? So one of the things I want to do is look at acquirers, acquirees, and the investors and the investees. Yeah. And so now when I do this, I get all the fancy rounds into MongoDB. Yeah, that you see for each whether what kind of round it was. What's all fancy in this case? The year and the quarter and the amount. Yeah, and Again, I can select this and I can say um, F again to explode each of these links using the set of predicates that I chose. And I'm using the tree view again. So now you see um, who invested 
when in MongoDB. But there's a little problem here, and that is that you really have to read, like, okay, what was the first time? The first time was in 2008, and it was Union Square, no? Oh yeah, Union Square partners alone that invested in it in MongoDB. So there's a better way to do it, and that is, let me see if I already defined that, is to look at the time bar. Oh, there's no start. What you see here is start time predicate, end time predicate, and momentary time predicate. Yeah. So let me go here and look look at I want to know when the investments were. And I say has funded at, and this is the time when there was an investment. Yeah. So we see this here. Oh, there it is. And I take this predicate and I copy URI to clipboard. Then I go to official graph options. I go to time bar. I go to a moment, this one here, and I copy it. Let's see this. Ah, I don't know why that was. Anyway, so now we can do the time. I can drag this thing here for time. And you see that the first funding was in 2008, quarter three, yeah, for just uh, one and a half million dollars. Then, um, Flybridge Capital got interested, Union Square still was interested, and they invested 3.4 million. Then um, Sequoia Capital got interested. Anyway, you get my point. Yeah, so now you can check over time how the, um, the graph is built up. Yeah, so here is yet another way to look at that. You can always hit the button here. And you see another way to look at it about when certain things happened. Uh, you can order it in all kinds of way, earliest or mean, or using the middle time, but it doesn't matter for now. Okay, so this was the, the lesson about the uh, time machine. Sorry that I went a little bit wrong. Then I'm not going to demo today because otherwise I won't stay within the hour about the um, pictures, but what you can do, is use picture for notes. So instead of having notes with text in it, you can have a directory with uh, JPEGs or PNGs in it, and you just tell Gruff what is the predicate to use for PIX maps, which is in global options, node label predicates, and custom predicates for node label PIX maps. And then you can tell Gruff the base locations of your PIX maps. Yeah, so you can use relative file names or well, all kinds of folders, and then you can use pictures. And one of the things that I actually never demo to you, and it doesn't really matter right now, but there might even be a picture in, uh, okay. One of the things, yeah, is that um, if there's a picture for a thing in Wikipedia or DBpedia, you just can always hit letter control B, yeah. And you find pictures, Intel Capital. I don't know if they have a picture. Very small picture, Salesforce. There must be a big tower there. Yes, wow. <laughs> yeah, so you can always use, play with pictures around. Uh, I like it because it makes it all look a little bit more sexy. All right, good. Um, so we almost got to the end. The final thing I wanted to show you that even if you are in Graph in the browser, let me go here again. So I'm in the browser. With my previous demo. So this is the bonus, the, the final bonus uh, thing I wanted to talk about, and that is using Gruff for Sparkle endpoints. Um, when we sent you this presentation, we also sent you a um, password that you can use um, so that you can access other, other uh, 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 Sparkle endpoints. So let me show you how you do that. You go connect to a Sparkle endpoint, Oh, so for this month, it's spherical data. Sphere, sorry, spherical wall for May. And then we go to uh, the DBpedia, the Sparkle endpoint there. And so now we're basically connected to Germany, I believe, yeah, to the, the this is one of the most wonderful repositories on the planet, yeah. And we, just so you can play with that, we created a bunch of example files. So you can just click here. And for example, you can ask, do a query about graph theory. Yeah, find old ABC where A 
as a broader graph theory and B as a broader A and C as a broader B. Yeah, so let's cross query and I run the query and I get um, results back. And so here is the graph of graph database information in the database. Well, let me make it a little bit smaller. Yeah. Personally, I, thought, I think it's really super cool that you now can take DBpedia output and just display it straight into um, uh, a Lego graph. Yeah. So we have a whole bunch of these queries, objects and subjects, uh, associated acts. Okay, so we get it back. All right. So, Again, uh, that's the end of the, the, the bonus lesson, the, uh, the Sparkle endpoints. Let me now go back to my presentation here. So here, uh, finally the end, so please try it out, yeah, and ask questions and please let us know what you think of the new graph in the browser. It's our first release. I mean, the standalone graph is rock solid. Uh, this one is completely new, so just try it out, play with it. If anything doesn't work or is weird, just let us know, send us an email and we'll make it better. And then if you want to play, you can always go to graph.elegograph.com at uh, 10035. So this is a demo server. It's probably set at like having 20 uh, connections at the time, so not all at the same time, please. And with that, I want to stop and ask Craig if there's any questions.